I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversation. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. When I came across Sky Bergman's new film, Lives Well Lived, I knew that I wanted to share this with all of you. I had tears in my eyes at some points. I had laughter, some aha moments, being able to hear the wisdom from 40 people aged 75 to 100. They are sharing their secrets for a life well lived. What does that mean? What can we learn from our older adults? What is the inspiration for the film? So many people have poured into our lives, our history. We cannot take those stories for granted, that wisdom for granted. Sky Bergman shares her film with us. I can't wait for you to hear this interview. She is an accomplished, award-winning photographer. Lives Well Lived is Sky's directorial debut, which will be featured on PBS in September. And let's talk about Lives Well Lived with Sky Bergman. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Sky Bergman, documentary filmmaker. She has created this wonderful place to share the wit and wisdom of older adults age 75 to 100 with her film, Lives Well Lived. Sky, thank you for talking with me today. I'm just so thrilled to be able to have a conversation about this and share all of this great work with people. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, I did have a chance to watch the film and I have to tell you I had tears in my eyes I had some like aha moments where just some of their comments and and perspectives really touched my perspective as we walk through life it really you know some commonalities and we'll kind of get into that of just showing up in this world with curiosity the lifelong learning all of those things where I really just sat with gosh this collective history of our older adults before us we can't let that go unnoticed and we still have to be able to talk about it so thank you for sharing this with all of us I think the world really does need to to see and hear it and just be continually amazed and open to learning about it I know that your grandmother was a huge part Part of your life. Can you share with us about your story, how she impacted you, and also what was your inspiration for the film? Yeah, sure. Well, I think that, you know, I was lucky enough that I grew up with my grandparents and I lived with them for quite some time and then near, very nearby. And even my great grandmother was alive when I was a kid. Um, She lived to be 97 and I was 19 when she passed away. So I had a lot of older adults in my life and I just thought that was normal that parents, that you grew up in that, you know, unit of all these older adults. So I was very fortunate and I used to, you know, cook with my grandmother all the time. We were Italian and anyone that's Italian will know a lot of things are based around food and eating and cooking. And um, I was lucky enough that my grandmother, when she turned 96, she came out to visit me for the first time in California. She lived in Florida and she spent the next four summers with me in um, the month of August she would spend with me in California. Because if you've ever been to Florida in the summertime, you know it's a good time to get out. And we started cooking together. We would go to the farmer's market on Thursday night and Friday would be our day of cooking. And what I realized was that she was an amazing cook, but she never wrote a recipe down. So like any other great cooks, it was just a handful of this and a pinch of that. And I realized that if I wanted to capture that, that I really needed to do some video of her cooking. And I had never done video before. I do teach photography at the university here, but I'd never done video, but I just felt like that was the way really to capture her. And that was really my first foray into doing any kind of video. And the film Lives Well Lived is my first film. So if I can do it, you can do it too. I think if you have a passion for something, you can make it happen. And Anyway, so fast forward to when my grandmother was turning 100, and I went back with her to Florida to celebrate her 100th birthday, and she was still working out at the gym at that point, and she did not start working out until she was 80, so it's never too late to start something new. She was a good role model for that, and I thought, you know, she's still working out. I'd better film her because there were so many days when I would think, 
I'm too tired to get up and go do my walk. And then I think of my grandmother at the gym, and I would she had a phrase, move it or lose it. And I would think, get up and go do <laughs> your thing. So I was hoping that um, you know she would be an inspiration to other people as well as to me. And I thankfully had a mic on her, and I just said as a throwaway comment, hey, Grandma, can you give me some words of wisdom? And she said, oh, words of wisdom, um, be kind, live life to the limits. And I thought, wow, um, I, my grandmother's such a role model to me. And I was looking at approaching 50, that half century mark, which I think is a big mark for many people. And I thought, what do I want the rest of my life to be like? And what do I want the role models for me to be like? And I think in the media at that point, there weren't very many positive role models for aging. What I saw was you can use this cream for Mm anti-aging. Everything was all about anti-aging. It wasn't about aging, which we are all doing every day. And I just thought, I need to find other people out there like my grandmother. And so really that was the beginning of the film was that moment at the gym with her where I realized she was giving these great words of wisdom to live by and to live the next half of my century of my life by. Mm -hmm. And I needed to find other people out there that could be an inspiration like she was. I can see it made such a difference in your life and watching the film, her face just lights up and you can you can tell when you're in her presence that you can't help but just feel happy. That's basically how I left um, feeling watching, watching your relationship together. Speaking of all of those people that you were able to talk with and learn from, just such a great group and such varied backgrounds and experiences. Experiences. How did you meet those folks that were in your film and get to know them? Yeah, you know, I like to say that my grandmother left me the greatest gift, which is that I now have 40 new grandparents as a result of working on this film. Um, and how I met most of the people initially, uh, and I didn't know I was going to do a film. I thought this was going to be like a little web series or something. So initially I sent out an email blast to my friends, family, and all the alum I've taught over the years I've been at Cal Poly. And I said, here's a link to this video of my grandmother at the gym and her words of wisdom. And if you have somebody like that in your life, please nominate them. And I was inundated by heartwarming nominations. I mean, it was so lovely. And I initially started doing um, the, the interviews based on those, you know, looking at those, um, those nominations that came in. And, and then um, I did an interview with this woman, Marion Wolf who was, is in the film, and if you haven't seen it, she was um, eight years old when um, the, before World War II broke out, and the Quakers in the United Kingdom were trying to rescue as many Jewish children as they could from Austria and Germany. And she was one of those children that was rescued. And she, they put a cardboard number around her neck when they, when they took her from Austria, and she still had that cardboard number. And she pulled that out, when we did the interview together. And I realized at that moment, you know, we have these moments that are just clear as like a dividing moment. And I realized at that moment that this needed to be a feature film and that it wasn't just about the words of wisdom that I was collecting, but it was also, as you mentioned earlier, about the stories that we really wanted to keep and share and hopefully remind people of our collective history because that will be lost when these people are gone. And so I really started looking for a diverse group of people that I could interview so that I could tell a more diverse story. That became really foremost on my mind when I was thinking about the other people that I was going to interview. Like, for example, one of the people in the film is Susie Edo Bauman, who was interned during World War II because although she was born in America, her parents were born in Japan. So she was of Japanese descent. And, um, and that was really important for me to tell the story of what happened in this country, because it's very easy to say all, all those things are happening over there, but to look inward is much more difficult. And I think that, um, you know, the other thing that I realized in, in interviewing all these people is that they all had really difficult moments in their life that they went through, but somehow I think their stories of resilience are what gets them through and what gets me through. When I look at that, the film, Um, you know, especially going through a pandemic, I realized, okay, I can get through this. I think of their stories and I think of all they went through and how positive they still were. And, and it really has helped me get through some tough times. I relate to 
understanding how they got through all of those hard times, right? We have people in our lives or in our families where we have conversation and you don't fully understand the extent of some things that they went through as they walked through those many years, but then seeing that resilience to come out on the other side. And it's just so, so encouraging, I think, for all of us as well. One of the things I enjoyed was really learning more about history that I wasn't fully aware of, right? Those those intricate details that get lost when we get to, you know, when we study history as a whole, but we miss those personal stories of people that have really lived through some of those moments and it and it really solidified that for me to be able to go back and and hear about how they walked through different situations to have a better life. And I just wanted to pull out a couple of of quotes by some of your um, interviewees. Emmy, right, who was in communist Russia at the time. And she always talked about how when bad things happen, you can't become a victim. There's always hope. And that's exactly just the sentiment for, I think, a lot of the people that you talk to is that there was a moment of trials and that they overcame it. And they wanted, they chose life and they chose being positive and didn't dismiss the hard times, but really moved through. And just what a, what a gift for all of us to be able to see that and go, okay, you know, maybe I can do that too. And I can walk through some hard things. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, Abby Justison, who's in the film, talks about uh, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, being very important. And um, the thing that she got from that was he was a Holocaust survivor. And um, the thing that she got from reading that book really was that there are many times in life when we can't control the things that are happening around us, but what we can control is our attitude. And our attitude is really the only thing that we have control over. And I think especially during this pandemic, no one can control that this is happening to all of us. But what we can control is our attitude of how we move through it. And I think that that, again, you know, all these lessons have really helped me get through some tough times. And that's certainly one of them that comes to the forefront. And along with our attitude and looking at that, what are some other things that you learned and that those guests taught you, those wonderful interviews? Yeah, well, I think there were really three things that they all had in common because everybody wants to know, well, what's the secret (laughs) for a happy life? How do you get to that point and be like these people are? And I think what I realized is that there were really three things. I think almost one of the most important was they all had a sense of purpose. And I think in this um, society, we think, oh, we're going to get to our golden years, we're going to retire, and life will be great. But if you don't plan for that and you don't have a sense of purpose, I think having that is so important. So, for example, in the film, you know, Lucky Louie, who is a mozzarella, he was a pediatrician, but now makes mozzarellas for his daughter's deli. Or, you know, um, Emmy Cleves, who you mentioned, she still teaches yoga. And having that sense of purpose, wanting to learn something new, wanting to give back, I think that's really vitally important. That's certain, certainly something that I'm going to take myself as into what I practice as I move through life. And then I think secondly was that everyone in the film had a good support system. And it didn't necessarily have to be family. It could be friends. But they, they definitely had a great support system. And, you know, even during this pandemic, um, Marion Wolf turned 90. And her husband, Paul Wolf, figured out how to do a surprise Zoom birthday party for her. So even in this time when it's hard to gather in person necessarily, there are still other ways to not feel isolated. And I think that that's that, that's an important um, element, whether even if it's just calling or writing people or what, they're, they're just feeling like you have that sense of connection, I think is really important. And then lastly, and we've touched upon this, is that the people in the film really saw life as a glass is half full rather than half empty. And that's such a cliche, but there's a reason that it's a cliche because they have been able to look back on those tough times and reframe it in a way that makes it positive. And so I think when you can look back on your life and and see it as a positive that helps you look forward in a positive way as well yeah and i think one person mentioned and i can't remember who but that be endlessly engaged in whatever your passion is 
And I love that. That's Rachel that. Wignon, yeah. yes. She, her. she also said that she wakes up every day expecting that something good is going to happen. And yeah. it may be postponed until the day, the next day or the day after, but inevitably something good is going to happen. And that's part of that positive attitude and reframing yeah. the way that we think about things and looking at life as a glass is half full. Okay, I know something good is going to happen. Oh, it didn't happen today. It's going to happen tomorrow. Right, you know what I think? Right. That yeah. that attitude is really... Um, attitude is so important. What I got from it too is so many of them just seemed really content in their own skin and their all of their interests, right, were that sense of purpose was so different for every single person. And it's just a really great reminder that all of our sense of purpose doesn't need to be identical. We can find what gives us that passion and helps us get up in the morning and and choose that for ourselves and really, really honor that like individuality. And I think also that your passion can change. I mean, I, I, I not to go back to Lucky Louie, but you know, he was a pediatrician for years. And at one point, and we became really good friends. And I, I said to him at one point, you know, you've been making mozzarella as longer than you were a pediatrician, <laughs> you know, and he did it out of a love of his daughter and for his daughter's deli, but that became his thing, you know, and I think that that also is really important to remember. Um, as, as CL says in the film, you know, change careers, you can do it. You don't have to stay stuck in one particular area. And I guess for me at this moment, that's really resonating because I'm 55 and um, I am definitely more comfortable in my own skin. I think that just happens as you get older and you don't care so much about what other people think. Um, but I'm also getting ready to retire from teaching at the end of December and looking at what is my next career. And it, I need to open up the space to do more filmmaking. And so it's really exciting to have all these wonderful people as role models that you can change careers and ask you age different things become important and and then that changes it's okay to not just stay in one direction and to allow for that flexibility and allow for that change to happen yeah such a good reminder we're we're constantly growing and changing our whole life Mm -hmm. (laughs) we are we're evolving i like to think of it as evolving (laughs) we are we are evolving so blanche brown talks about really living in the moment. And I think that that is something that also really became a very important thing for me to remember because we are many times so busy with so many of our devices and so many things that we have to do that we forget to really just be present and live in the moment. And I think as you get older, you start appreciating the fact that you have far less time in front of you than behind you. And so every moment is a gift. And I think you really appreciate it in a different way. And I have found myself really trying to stop and appreciate and and take more time to just take in that moment rather than just moving on to the next thing. So I think that's another really, really important lesson that we can all learn. Yes, and when we talk about the film's title is Lives Well Lived, what is your definition? How would you describe that? That's a good question because you're turning (laughs) (laughs) turning it on to me. Um, You know, I I would say that um, my grandmother's way of living through life was to be kind. And so my definition definition of life well lived is really to just be kind. If we were all a little bit kinder to each other, imagine what a great world this would be. And that kindness could be something just as nice as smiling at someone, saying thank you. I mean, it doesn't have to be big things. It can be those little things that really can be uh, monumental in the end and really make somebody's day. And you make somebody's day and then they want to make somebody else's day. And just that... Uh, you know, practicing the art of being grateful and mindful, I think is really important. I agree. And one of your guests talked about looking up, just like noticing the beauty around us that as a younger generation, you kind of talked about that. We have so much technology around us that we forget when we're walking through our world just to pay attention to all of those small moments and connect with people because that's really collectively what creates a life is all of those little moments that come together being able to just enjoy enjoy the moment like you talked about and the beauty one of my other favorite comments was that luck has the aroma of perspiration (laughs) (laughs) indeed i feel like i've been living that in this last six months getting ready for the film to be on pbs and i you know that was um 
that was one. Jules Hawk said that, and um, Lou says, the harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> and I, I do feel like there is part of that. But I do also feel like if you find what you love doing and you're doing it because you're passionate about it, it's not work. It's you, you love doing it because you want to get the word out about something or you love working with a group of people. And even though you're working, you're passionate about it and it just happens. And that's the best possible scenario. It is. Were your, I'll call them your friends because now they're all your friends. Were they really excited to know that they would be on this film and being able to share their stories? I love hearing some of the behind the scenes because I, when you said when you started out with filming, you weren't sure where this would evolve to. So tell, can you talk I, about I that, that process? They, <laughs> yeah, I think that they do get a kick out of the fact that now they're going to be on PBS. I mean, I don't think that they ever realized that. And I, I will say that one of the proudest moments I had with the film was that we did a sneak preview of the film and 27 of, four, of the 40 people that I interviewed were able to be at this sneak preview, 850 people, standing ovation at the end. And to be able to share that night with them and to have them really be the stars and to get that, you know, those accolades, I think was probably one of the highlights of my night and my, my grandmother was there I mean my cheeks were hurting so much from smiling and I, I really um, you know I think that they, they get a kick out of it but more importantly um, I, I was on a panel discussion with a number of them uh, when the film came out in theaters and, and I was saying to the audience how grateful I was to all the people in the film for sharing their story with me because without their stories obviously there would be no film and Paul Wolf, who's in the film, got up and said, no, we are the ones that are grateful to you for caring enough to collect our stories, for validating our lives, for making it mean something. And I, I think that that was, I, I really hadn't thought of it that way. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I do have on the, on the website for the film is that people can share their stories because I realized that I could go on forever doing this film and I would never have ended, but I had to just put a number on it and say at 40, I'm going to stop. Otherwise I will never get a film done. <laughs> but there is a place on the website where people can share their stories. And I would really encourage people to do that. Even if you don't want to share it on the website, at least the questions that I asked are on the website. And I think that's a good starting point. It's hard to interview somebody and just say, well, tell me something about yourself. You're an interviewer, so you know that. But a lot of people, if they sit down with their family, and they, they want to gather some history and they want to have that connection, but they just don't know where to start. And, you know, I'll tell you a quick aside. I had a, a student who went on the interview with me with um, Lucky Louie. The student's name was James. And we did the interview and, and Lou was so much fun and he had so many one-liners. I used to call them Louisms. And um, James and I went out to lunch after our interview and James said to me, oh my goodness, I never knew that older people could talk so much. And I just started laughing. I mean, because for me, I had grown up around older people and that wasn't even a, I mean, I, I just, it had never crossed my mind that that would even be a thing. And, and I said to him, well, don't you have an older person in your life? And he said, yeah, I have a grandfather, but we really don't connect that much. And I don't see him that much. And it was right before Thanksgiving. And I said to him, look, you're going to take these questions that we just asked Lou and you're going to take them. This is your homework assignment. I'm your teacher. I can make you do this. You're going to go ask your grandfather these questions when you go home for the weekend. And he came back from that trip just beaming from ear to ear because he had the best conversation he'd ever had with his grandfather. His grandfather was so excited that he wanted to know something about him. And they have had a connection ever since that they never had before because neither one of them really knew where to start that conversation. And so I would say, you know, try and, and, and take that time with an older adult in your life or an older friend and just get to know them a little bit more. Use the questions that I have. Blame it on me, those questions that you asked, because I think that helps to start that discussion. And then, of course, you're going to go off on tangents, but at least it gets that conversation going. And that's so important because the only way to combat stereotypes of ageism is by knowing somebody from that other group. And that goes in both directions for older adults of younger, you know, younger adults and younger adults of older adults. And once you get to know somebody from that other group, it's really hard to have a stereotype because now you have a friend in that older group and you realize that those stereotypes are just that stereotypes. And so, um, you know, that's become my next big mission is doing these intergenerational connections. So 
And a wonderful mission to have. We need it. <laughs> the voice and, and the platform to be able to share how to connect with people, especially understanding that it really is just asking questions and then the ability to show up and listen and create that friendship and start the conversation. So we're so thankful for that. Absolutely. And I'm really happy PBS Learning Media is going to do, we've been doing this um, with universities and high schools, connecting generations. And PBS Learning Media is picking that up. And in November, they're going to launch a, an intergenerational project using the Lives Well Lived film as a catalyst. Oh. So that's wonderful, wonderful to have that it happening. It is. It is. That's so wonderful. We'll be looking for that. And along those lines, tell us more. What's next for you? What's happening in the future? Yeah, well, I think, you know, really, I, I'm, as I mentioned, that it, creating the intergenerational connections is really important. And I've been working with a professor here at the university University, who teaches a psychology of aging class and we have been working with older adults and connecting the students and doing a whole learning module that we've been doing for the last three years and last year we did it all virtually with senior planet members um, that's part of AARP and and that was wonderful um, and, and, you know one of the students said that in doing this project it was the first new friend they made during the pandemic and how cool is that that their first new friend was an older adult I just love that and so that's kind of on the horizon is doing more creating more of the, the more spaces for these intergenerational projects to happen whether it's through PBS learning media and doing that module for K through 12 or on our website where we have that available to people or through universities and high schools um, and then I've done a few short films, all with an intergenerational twist to them. One was called um, Forever Voters. It was about the League of Women Voters going into high schools and trying to encourage students to register and pre-register to vote. And I also, and why their one vote really matters. And I also talked to the students about what they wanted to vote about because there's this uh, illusion that the students don't really care and that couldn't be farther from the truth. And then the other short film that I did is called Mochi Suki, which is about um, uh, the Japanese have a tradition of making mochi, which is pounding rice into a paste and making mochi balls the week between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And I love that because I used to cook with my grandmother and that was when the love came out and the stories were passed down from one generation to the next. I love seeing that in, in that Mochi Suki ceremony. And um, the, that's a short film, it's only about four minutes, but that's gonna lead into the next feature film, which will all be about, you know, the US is a country of immigrants. And what are those things that we take food-wise that we pass down from one generation to the next? And what are those things that are passed down, that knowledge, that wisdom that's passed down from one generation to the next when we're doing these ceremonies around food? Because everybody loves to eat yeah. and everybody loves to gather for those things. So I think, figure that'll be a, a next good next feature film to work on. <laughs> I love that. It's so true. My We, are, we have that commonality and that my grandma lived with our family when I was growing up. And, and that started my passion for not only working with older adults, but really just embracing the family history. And a big part of that is it's in the kitchen. That's where everyone gathers. Uh, talking with my residents that I used to work with, my favorite thing to do was learn their story, where they came from. Typically, it was not from Minnesota, <laughs> where where I live. Right. And, <laughs> where I live. and just most of that also was sharing food history and what they right eating and the memories around that and how it really brought people together. And so I'll tune into that for sure because I just, I value that so much. I think it's so important. And it really is, if you think about how people connect with each other, it's around the table. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And so I think that that's, you know, like I said, I think everything that I do from here on out will have that intergenerational connection to it, to it in some way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. We will direct people where to watch the film that'll be included on our episode description but I'll also have you tell us where can people learn more and what can we look for sure so our website is lives-well-live.com or if you just google lives well lived it'll be the first thing that comes up 
Um, if you go to pbs.org and search for Lives Will Live, it'll come up there as well. And, um, but if you go to our website, you can sign up for our newsletter list, and we'll keep you apprised of everything that's happening with, our, with the film and with all these intergenerational projects. That sounds great, and we are cheering you on and so <sighs> thankful that you put this out into the world. I know I enjoyed it so much. I'll be sharing it with people in my life, and it's just one quote is, age is only a number. It's how you feel and act that makes you that age. So here's to just us feeling and acting the way that we we want to in the moment <laughs> absolutely i love it yes, yes. <laughs> well thank you very yes. much nicole it was wonderful <laughs> thank you thank you for listening today if you enjoyed our episode please subscribe and give us five stars <laughs> in all honesty we'd love to hear from you thank you so much for listening to our episode